All right. So for today, every student was asked to find their own favorite kind of humanism and uh, read an article about it, write a little short essay on it, and give a presentation about what it is and why they like it. So, Thomas, are you ready? Uh, I should be ready. Let me go ahead and figure out how to share my screen. Oh, I gave you permission. There we go. I should be sharing? Yes. Perfect. Okay, well, for me, uh, let me get this set up. I found ethical humanism, which I was kind of really drawn to. Um, I enjoyed hearing about it and reading about it. And I, I'll have my article I read cited within, and I'll talk about it when I get to it. But um, when I was looking through the different types of humanism, I couldn't really find myself agreeing with any of the main points that they were making. But then I found ethical humanism and it all just kind of clicked. So I'll go over kind of like a quick little background and why I like it. So ethical humanism, in my opinion, is humanism for the modern non-religious. It's not necessarily an answer to religion. It's not an answer to atheism. It just kind of presents morals and ethics as their own kind of exclusive form of humanism. It was founded by Felix Adler, who was born in the 19th century, raised as a rabbi, and who kind of was influenced by a neo-Kantian philosophy and the exploitation of workers in Germany. And because of this, he was almost kind of dissuaded from religion. He believed that morals and ethics didn't have to be from a deity or theologically based. And he kind of put this into his speaking positions whenever he left his position as a rabbi in training and went to Cornell University in the USA. And after he started telling people about what his beliefs and ethics, he uh, founded the New York Society for Ethical Culture, which was the first of its time. Um, some of the principles that these uh, ethical humanists talked about were principles such as like morality is infinite theology. It does not have to be based on religions, just like the Ten Commandments in Christianity. Um, he also believed that the Industrial Revolution and Industrial Society were things that religion just could not possibly address because you know, ancient religions could not comprehend what modern society was going through, all the issues that came with it, you know, child labor, worker exploitation, you know, even some things such as uh, gender equality. Uh, he also believed that philanthropy is necessary to advance morality, kind of similar to how Aristotle believed that generosity and, you know, Socrates believed that generosity needed to be necessary, but not overt generosity. He also believed that self-reform should go together with social reform. That as you work to improve yourself, that you should help you know, improve others. He believed that ethical societies required a republican governance as opposed to monarch, uh, monarchical, uh, monarchical governance. And um, it kind of showed in the way that ethical humanists presented themselves. And the last thing that was very important that I thought was interesting was just like Socrates, he believed in educating the youth. And uh, two points I'd just like to go over that kind of made me really like it was that morality is independent of theology. And um, this kind of is presented in the idea that replacing theology with uninfluenced morality is what ethical, you know, humanists want. They don't want theology to be the base for anybody's choices or anybody's morals. They'd rather have morals be an intrinsic part of humanity. Kind of like in the innate goodness of a person, there's innate morals within a person. So one quote that I got from a, a reading from a Colin Campbell was that he, the ethical humanists seek to disentangle moral ideas from religious doctrines, metaphysical systems, and ethical theories, and to make them an independent force in personal life and social relations. And that just kind of stood out to me. Um, so this led, these ethical humanists wanted to disassociate from kind of religious creeds. So they had fellowships, but they did not have rituals or ceremonies like the Catholic Church or Protestants. They would just gather and talk about morals and ethics. And because of this, ethical humanism takes more of a neutral stance on religion as opposed to kind of an aggressive anti-religious stance. They just want to disassociate from religion. They don't want to denounce religion. They also believe that philanthropy is necessary to advance morality, and that's what really stood out to me. These people were usually rich, educated men, usually white men, 
and instead of using their you know wealth to just advance themselves they believed in the mantra deed not creed and i thought that was interesting they used it in ethical humanism to promote education healthcare, and public housing and during the 19th century when it was formed they um they actively went out in the communities and built public housing they built um, hospitals and they built kindergartens which were kind of revolutionary for the time uh, and unlike the other philanthropic movements that were in religions, they didn't uh, proselytize. They did not believe in converting people. They didn't want people to become um, ethical humanists. They were very picky about it. They actually would only accept new members through sponsors. They also did youth outreach to continue educating you know, the next generation. And they focused on fostering community and citizenship, which I think is very important in humanism. And uh, this is the work that I cited. It was towards the social, uh, sociology of irreligion. And it talked pretty in depth about ethical humanism. And I really enjoyed reading it. And uh, yeah, that's kind of why I like it. Very good. All right. Round of applause for Thomas. Um, anybody have a question or a comment? Oh. Oh, that's applause. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I guess maybe take notes about what you might want to ask Thomas. I'll put you in small groups later. Whoever you get in with your group, then you'll be able to make comments. Um, it does fit. Do you think, Thomas, it fits with these, the virtues that I've been talking about, deed, not creed, um, so the way, I mean, the way I'm teaching stuff is you could go the direction of ethical humanism, you could go the direction of a religion, um, and, and this group was indifferent, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Okay, Alexis. Uh, if, if I punch this button, do you end up in the gallery or how does this work? How did you get yourself in the gallery, Thomas? Um, I just hit the share screen button. Okay. I found it. I got it. All right. Okay, good. Um, I think this one. Oh, it's making me click other buttons. Can you guys see my screen? Nope. <laughs> Hold on, my, my system wants me to disable like my firewall or something. So I'm sorry. Okay. I have to, you might want to come back to me. This might take a minute. I have to type in my password. Okay. Unless Thomas, yeah, if he has advice. Um, Aiden. I can go ahead and present. Can you hear me, Dr. Buck? Yep. Can, okay, good. Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Okay, cool. So I chose humanism and environmentalism. Good. Okay, humanism and environmentalism. So um, the humanistic approach towards the environment is probably similar to pretty much uh, a lot of them, a little bit of what Thomas was talking about. It takes religion out of it and it focuses more on like the science of it and like how we can help nature. Um, like the key thing it talks about in a lot of them, in the article I read and some of the other stuff I read, is that we only have one earth, so we need to, um, we need to preserve it. We need to do what it takes to battle it. There's a lot of problems um, in the environment, like global warming overpopulation and pollution and much more. Um, but if we take a humanistic approach, we can live in moderation and we can just do the little things that keep our environment clean. Um, it goes a long way. And if we can bring everyone in to do it, then um, it's a 
just because one way. So then connected to the Aristotle, the UN Human Rights, and uh, the Humanistic Manifestos. Um, so with Aristotle and his virtues, he talks a lot about living in moderation. And um, that's a big thing with this, um, just because greed and taking from the environment is a big thing that hurts the earth. Um, just with fossil fuels primarily, but also with forestry and just so many things. Um, but if everyone could live in moderation, like Aristotle talks about, then it goes a long way. And then the UN and their human rights. Um, the UN is very good with bringing everybody together. And um, that's very important with environmentalism because it takes everybody. It's not just one country or one group of people. It really needs everybody to, to contribute. And then um, with the manifestos, um, also brings everybody together. So, you know, getting everybody into the uh, benefit society and promotes environmentalism. See, some of the flaws. So, I didn't expect to talk about flaws, but um, and one of the things we're talking about, and I think it's worth mentioning that a humanistic approach towards the environment tends to put humans in the center, um, which is understandable since, you know, we're the most developed species. And, we contribute the most to um, the Earth going up and down health-wise. Um, but putting humans in the center, it takes away from the focus of some species and uh, it can contribute to the downfall of species. Um, just because we can lose sight of them, that kind of thing happened like, with the dodo bird. That's why I included that picture. And just other species that are now extinct. Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a bad thing, but we just shouldn't lose focus on everything. Then I looked at um, two articles. This one, the first one was an abstract for a book. Um, I didn't actually read the book, but the abstract is, it's a really good abstract and it just talks about, um, it talks about, first of all, the flaws, and then it also talks about some of the ways that um, the earth is being harmed, I guess. And then this one is more, the second article is more about um, humanism and the environment. So it's more about what my other slides really talk about. So yeah. That's it. All right. Well, what are you going to do about, OK. What I liked about Aristotle when I first read it is it says human beings are not by nature either good or evil, but their conditioning makes them one or the other. Um, but it's always a lot of work. Virtue always takes an activity, right? It's always it takes an effort. Whereas the, the vices tend to be passive. You're just reacting to something. Does that make sense? So this does put a lot of faith in people, Aiden, and I'm not sure you have that much faith in people, right? Plus, greed is a big problem, right? Because we have a system based on exploiting nature. So how are we going to change that system? Do you, I mean, do these things concern you? Yeah, of course they do. Um, I mean, I don't have all the answers, but I do think one way that people are starting to um, do is they're making clean things better. So like with, in my opinion, electric cars, they're a lot better than gas cars. And just because they're better, I think people will want to choose them and they will uh, clean the environment. And then I think like with straws, I think we'll make straws better. Just, you know, with everything that's... Well, they also have, they also have to be cheaper, right? And that's where I think Bill Gates and his group is investing all the money to create the products, right? That otherwise would add to the cost quite a bit, you know, if it weren't some billionaires. So the basically the billionaires are screwing up the natural free market, right? Because Gates is not reacting to demand. He's deciding there's a problem that's a lot bigger than just letting people do what they want. Does that make sense? 
Yes, ma'am. He's not going to force them, but his goal is to make products that are better products at cheaper price, right? And then they'll do it. But yes, he did realize they're not going to do it on their own because of the way the system's set up right now. So again, people aren't born loving to, oh boy, I can burn some more fossil fuels. You know, <laughs> that's not their goal, right? Their goal is just to have a car and then the system's been set up. So that would mean that, you know, they end up doing virtue rather than vice, not because of some character trait, right? But because of just the way the economy works. Um, does that make sense to you? Yes, ma'am. I completely agree. I think um, it's just more convenient for the people, including me, to uh, live not as clean as I could be. But, but the system has been set up that way, right? There's been a lot of incentives and tax breaks for the uh, gas and oil people. So that's, it'll change very quickly, but the system was never a free market. That's important to know. Um, all right. Who is next? Hey, Dr. Beck, I've gotten my- um, Okay, my Alexis, go for it. I'm glad. All right. You're a better woman than I am. Usually if I if something like that happens, I totally freak out. All right, here we go. Should be able to see everything. Yes. Good. Okay. All right. So I did humanistic educate the humanistic education theory. Uh, here's my list of readings. If anybody is curious, I can post them in the chat if you want to read them. Um, so facts of a humanistic education. Uh, students' learning should be self-directed. Humanistic teachers believe that students will be more motivated to learn a subject if, something, if it's something that they need and want to know. Uh, schools should produce students who want to know and uh, who want and know how to learn. The goal of education should be to foster students' desire to learn and teach them how to learn. Students should hopefully be self-motivated in their studies and desire to learn on their own by the time they finish their schooling education. Students should be able to self-evaluate. Humanistic educa educators believe that their grades are irrelevant and only self-evaluation is meaningful. Grading encourages students to work for a graded for a grade and not for personal satisfaction. In addition, humanistic educators are opposed to objective tests because they test a student's ability to memorize and not to provide sufficient educational feedback to the teacher and the student. Emotions are a really important part of the learning process. Um, unlike traditional educators, humanistic teachers do not separate the cognitive and affective domains. And finally, students learn best in non-threatening environment. Uh, humanistic educators insist that schools need to provide students with a non-threatening environment so they feel secure to learn, uh, basically a place where they feel free to share their opinions without fear of being judged or oppressed in the classroom. Uh, some of the values that humanistic teachers have are free will. Students should be able to possess a free will in their classrooms. Uh, once again, emotions impact learning. Humanistic teachers should be able to recognize that their current situations and um, Emotions will affect how they learn in the classroom. If they're angry, if they're having hard times at home, if they're coming to class hungry all the time, and they should be able to uh, help in some way in that situation. Uh, they also believe in interest, intrinsic motivation. Students should have their own will to learn. And finally, they believe in the innate goodness of humans. So they teach from the point of view that all humans are good. Uh, the education theory, the above mentioned principles led to an education focused on actual humanity, not standardized tests or curriculum with no appreciation for the human condition. Properly established humanistic education systems will allow students to flourish. And that word is blocked and I can't see it. Students really can learn. Learn to develop <laughs> an enthusiasm enthusiasm for learning and cultivating relationships with their fellow humans. A humanistic education accepts human flaws and works to promote the strength in all of students and it considers emotional states and how that impacts learning. So the one thing that I don't like about the humanistic education theory is that if this was applied in schools, it would allow students to leave with basically their own education and not everybody is gonna leave school with the same things. So I think if the theory is to be applied, 
um, it would be best used in a set curriculum, but allow students to focus on topics in a required subject they find interesting and motivated to learn about. That is humanistic education theory. Okay, what did you like about it? How does it compare to the education you've had? I really feel like I haven't had a lot of, how do I get back? Uh, you, you're going to leave the meeting. Oh my God. <laughs> Okay, I figured out. All right. <laughs> um, I really like about uh, the series because I feel like in my own edu in my own education, I haven't had um, really the ability to explore what kind of interests me. I've had this curriculum and this idea of standardization shoved down my throat, and that's really kind of given me a distaste for traditional education because I, you know, some people don't test well or some people need more help in educational, you know challenges and I feel like that isn't applied in normal schools. So I feel like if this theory would apply, it would allow people to actually like learning or figure out a way to like learning and be able to take that onto their you know normal lives. Well, we have this, here's a question. We have a puritanical strain in our culture. We have two main strains, the puritanical people are by nature bad, right? And then the humanistic, right? And they've the puritanical is the one that's more authoritarian. And so, you know, you're in lockstep, right? The assumption is that you'll be lazy. If you, right, you won't ever get self-motivated. You'll just be lazy. Um, so what would you say if somebody says that's a problem? Every, you know, kids won't sit still. They won't get self-motivated. Um, we have to make them all literate. So we've got to have these standardized tests, no child left behind. They'll, they'll get left behind even worse. What do you think? I mean, I think it's because they've never had an option to fall in love with learning or be able to find some, their own way in education. They've always, you know, had this idea forced upon them that, you know, people are inherently lazy and they're not going to want to do these things if push the opportunity. I think if, you know, given like small kids, this type of education, it would be really interesting. And I think we would see really good results. Okay. So we go back to that formation of character thing. Yeah. Okay, good. Were you surprised at it? Did you know that, did you expect to find something like this? Um, I figured something up uh, like this was out here, but I was really, you know, excited to see like an actual formulated theory and there were a couple, I didn't get the time, but there were a couple of like school, like uh, articles about schools that follow this principle. And I think I'd really like to go back and read those when I have the time. Okay. So, all right. Um, let's see, Rossi, did you want to go now? You don't have a PowerPoint, you said, but that's fine. Um, I, have, like, I can go now. I, I did put, to, I managed to put together a slide. I, I wrote like all my reactions in the post, so I can put it together. Okay. So um, let me share my screen. Can you see my screen? That's okay. Yes. Yep. Okay, so hi everyone. So today I'm going to talk about liberal humanism and we are going to begin with understanding what it is. So liberal humanism is a philosophical and literary movement in which man and his cap capabilities are the central control and it recognizes the value of human being as an individual and his rights to liberty and happiness. Liberal humanism originates in the 24th, in the 14th century, my bad, in <laughs> Europe during the Renaissance, not the 24th century. Close and, enough. <laughs> and it represented a shift towards a more secular way of thinking, emphasizing in learning of humanities, such as history, poetry, and moral philosophy. And 
the reason that I there are three main reasons why I like liberal humanism. It's about giving people a second chance when we are talking about death penalty. Liberal humanism objects penalty oh death penalty, and they rather put prisoners in prison. They rather put murderers into prison and let them rediscover their sanctity. So this is when someone does something wrong to another person, usually people will get mad and they want to take revenge. But I feel like liberal, liberal humanism gives people a second chance to pause and to get a chance to reflect on their actions and be able to change and develop themselves and rediscover that sanctity within them. And also it protects individuals sacredness and freedom. So it gives people the right to do what they wish. There are some shortcomings to liberal humanism, including how it is um, idealistic and naive, and it relies on the belief that the good qualities of humanity will always override the bad in the end. And it tends to discount religion and the belief in God. And these are the two readings that um, I use for liberal humanism. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Boy, if you just whip that up, that's pretty good. <laughs> All right. Very good. Applaud for um, hands up, guys. Rate, you know, applause for Rossi. All right. Um, Shamima, did you want to present today or not? Shamima's had a terrible toothache. Professor, I haven't watched the video and I didn't read the article. Can I present my class if it is possible? That's fine. Just want to make sure you're not ignored. Uh, Blaine, you're next. Hello. Um, yeah, so I, like, I do Zoom on my phone. I don't like, even have Zoom on my computer. So is it okay if I send you or somebody like the PowerPoint? Yeah, why don't, why isn't it not me? Can you send it to somebody else? You can send it to me, Blaine, and you can come in here. Okay. I'm so afraid I'm not gonna get the right button, but I know that all of you, you know, are able to, I gave you access, so. Okay, I just sent it. Uh, I'm gonna go to Alexis's uh, room probably. On and just say. You can you can do it from your own. Okay. True. Okay. So I'll do that. Um, I'll just tell you when to change slides. Thank you. It said access denied, so I sent you a request. I'm gonna try to fix it. I, I said anyone who has the anyone has the link. All right, Blaine, you can try me. How would I find I, I sent it to both of you? Oh, I how would I know? It. How would I know you sent it? Like just I emailed it. Oh, email. All right. That's what I needed to know. There. Um um, I'm, uh, I got the app if you want me to share it. Oh, okay. I've got it too, but go ahead, Alexis. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So yeah, scientific humanism. That's my thing. Uh, I like science, so that's that's why I chose it. Um, that is. So that's the, the literal definition of scientific humanism. It's a form of humanist theory. Uh, it's based on like, um, oh, uh, can you go back to slide, Alexis? Or is it on like autoplay? Next slide. It should be the second one. This yeah, is OK, cool, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's uh, essentially that uh, humans should use 
like the scientific method, uh, research, inquiry, curiousness, that kind of thing, in order to help humans and help the world, help nature, all that stuff. Um, and then the next one, please. Thank you. Um, so the fundamentals, um, almost carbon copy of the definition um, that humans should use the scientific method and the principles uh, improve themselves, um, their family, their country, world, however big you want to go, really. If we ever get planet faring, it'll probably expand, uh, expand to that as well. Um, and scientific humanism also um, almost all the time focuses on uh, objective reasoning and logic. That is, very, those are two very big um, like points of it. Um, and that uh, truths and lies, they need to be proved one way or the other using facts. It's like you need to have facts to back up what you say and what you know. Um, that's like a big part of like this, uh, the scientific method, testing your hypothesis, um, testing it several times just to make sure like, you're right. Cause you don't wanna say some big groundbreaking theory that you just came up with and you only tested it one time and somebody else tests it a couple more times and they're like, hey man, you're wrong. So like that, that would really suck. So that's one of the biggest pinnacles. Um, next slide, please. One of the ways that that's used is by analyzing the world around us and using that to create solutions for problems that we may have. That image below uh, demonstrates how humans looked at birds and saw their beaks and um, like gradually like learn more about it and transform it into the mask and like what we know today. That's how the play doctor mask originated like, um, and why they're often associated with crows is because the inspiration for the play doctor mask came from crows. And then, um, so it's just a large pocket on your face. You could stuff filters. Normally at that point it was cotton, but now we have like better, more sophisticated filters. And the, uh, especially in Plague Doctor time, uh, like the Black Plague, they would put like roses or poppies or lilies or something that smells sweet and nice to cover the scent of the Black Death. That's why the um, ring around the rosy, pockets full of posy. They would put uh, posy flowers in their pockets and in their masks to cover up the scent of death. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, yeah. A little dark, but yeah <laughs> wow <laughs> i didn't know that yeah um but um yeah and so we have we have wants we have goals we have needs and the black plague uh chase and by using science we, we create solutions and uh, just look at the world around you and fix stuff because i mean who does it better than nature really <laughs> I mean, we've lived this long um, and uh, next slide, please, Alexis. Thank you. Um, why I like hum scientific humanism is because I just, I like science. I've always been very into science. I've always been a very curious person, just in general. Um, and I'm pursuing chemistry here. And um, by using our intellect, using science and research and tests and hypotheses and like helping our curiousness grow, we can help like everybody. We can um, help change everything for the better. Um, and my sources, uh, the first one is like the literal diff definition of, uh, oh, sorry, Alexis, can you go to the next slide? Sorry, I should have said that. Um, the first one is literally the definition. Um, and the, the second one is uh, a website article and then the third one is a piece from a journal. It's about 16 pages. Yeah, thank you for the time. Scientific humanism. Thanks Alexis for letting, for sharing it. So did that surprise you, Blaine? Or did you figure you'd find something like that? Uh, it took me a minute to find like types of humanism. Thomas actually recommended that one. Um, because we were talking for a minute about it. So thank you, Thomas, for recommending that to me. Um, but once I found it, I was like, 
Yep, that's that's pretty accurate. Um, <laughs> so I like it. Okay, so Blaine, do you remember when I was talking about John Stuart Mill? And his hypothesis is that we should treat women equally and the society will get better, right? And he I don't specifically remember him, but I do agree with that statement. Right. But the idea is that he had to, he used traditional scientific method, which is based on facts, to argue for this complete reversal of everything people had experienced, right? That is a very cool way of playing the system on its head. Okay. <laughs> it works. Well, Blaine, that's what I want you know you to think about because a lot, science really can get used to lack vision, right? Because well, we have to have the facts, right? So a lot of the reasons why there were some scientists that hesitated for so long about climate change is because. The climate change people 70 years ago were looking at the trends, right? And they were trying to look forward, but that there were a number of scientists. Well, I don't see that, right? It's not there right now. Does that make sense, Blaine? Yeah, I think I see what you're talking about. I feel like now, like, like modern era, I feel like especially more than then, we tend to look at, um, which we, we've, broadened our view of like our I guess you could say our fact database because like like we pull help from like economics or um I'm blanking on other things like uh, uh chemists will branch out to physicists and like what have you in order to get help to prove something instead of just saying I can only use my little pool I feel like that's part of the climate change thing. They were like, well, the chemistry doesn't show that the poles are collapsing, but the physicists over here were like, well, actually, but with teamwork that we have now, we're like, okay, so this is what's actually happening. And now we're starting to agree. To actually yeah, move right. Forward. right. So modern science was based on um, ultimately trying to manipulate nature and doing it by by looking at more and more specialized connections in nature in order to exploit it, right? And But now we have system science where we have to figure out, uh, we have modeling, computer modeling, because what we're, the whole different model is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, that the parts of nature interact with each other and you have synergistic effects. Does that make sense to you, Blaine? Is that what the scientists are doing? I mean, yeah, kind of. I mean, I feel like, like almost everything that we do is, if not exploitation, it's at least slightly manipulating nature and the world around us. Because I mean, like we saw, hey, that plant is growing something that we can grind up, make into a powder, and then that we can cook that and make bread. That's how we found wheat. Uh, we started to grow it, and then, like we were using nature. Right. No. Or, no. Like, science now. It's, but right. It's just that we're now trying. Now we're we're uh, fouling our own bed, right? Fouling. Oh, okay. So I mean, yeah, we we have kind of been hurting the planet for a while. So I mean, now we're trying to fix it. Just um, we're getting there slowly but surely. <laughs> it's and again there's two camps of people one of them is figuring out how to become more integrated right that would be regenerative agriculture is uh plant things the way that farmers did it a long time ago so the land the earth stays um fertile and then there's the other group that um wants to more and more engineer nature right or engineer these forces. Uh, Bill Gates is going as far as finding ways to suck carbon out of the air. Okay, we have to we have to literally create a whole new system that'll get carbon out of the air. But anyway, um, what I was getting at was synergistic effects. Um, 
putting the same amount of carbon into the atmosphere this year, as opposed to 100 years ago, has an entirely different effect. Does that make sense, Blaine? Yeah, I think I know what you, I think I see what you're talking about. And yeah, personally, I feel like, like the two of them, they can go hand in hand, like engineer a better way to have regenerative farming. I feel like that would be pretty cool. I feel like hopefully that's what the current farmers are trying to do, but I'm not a farmer, so I don't know. No, no, it's, I mean, there's so much going on, right? There's so much going on. Um, but the other issue is, how are we, you know, people are worried, you know, about China and we're supposed to be number one. How can we be number one if we don't teach our kids science? <laughs> okay. I feel like a lot of people now just try to pass the blame. I feel like that's, that's one of the big problems with that. Just like, oh, China's doing it worse. But we right. are too. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's that, but there's also just, how are we going to solve things if we don't teach our kids science? Get, yeah, I, I agree with that. Yeah, I would think that you weren't. How can we, you know, oh, uh, yeah. Well, anyway, how can we compete with the Chinese if we don't teach our kids science? I don't know. Um, all right. Who is next? Who do I? Uh, de, uh, let's see. Uh, Samantha. Your name is up there. I'm listening to Waitress, guys. Hi, Professor Beck. So I completely missed the part where we weren't supposed to go over ones we've already learned. And so I did my deep dive on Christian humanism, specifically during the Renaissance area. If you want me to present that, I can. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Okay. It's more Protestant humanism, I guess you would say, than necessarily just Christian humanism, but... Really, because when you bring up what you like about it or whatever, it's great. I don't care. Okay. Yeah, too. I'm see. just waiting for the share feature. Wait, I've, I've let you share it, haven't I? Oh, because I have multiple participants can share. I have that punched. There it goes. Okay. Sorry, Professor. I'm trying to figure out how to actually like share this correctly because it won't allow me to move my screen. Oh, anybody else got um, advice? What exactly is wrong with it? She can't move it forward. Is that right? Let me. Yeah, it's. I'm hitting share, and then it gives me options to share, and it's not allowing me to actually. Like, it allowed me to share Chrome, but I can't control Chrome. Um. Yeah, that's weird. <laughs> I've never had to do that before. Okay. Well. Why don't you try sending it to me then via email? I'll take I'll take a chance on this one. Okay, I'll send it to you right now. Which one do you have? How do I get out of this thing? Okay. All right. So now I'm gonna be bold. I'm gonna actually try to do this. It's the one it's like Shrek sings this song about like what he would be if he wasn't an over it makes me cry down. Thanks. All right. All right, I'm going back to my whole time. Okay, Professor Beck, I said there it is. Um, let's see. Open it. Um, share it. Well, let's see. I'm going to share it with you. Um, and see if when I share it with you, you can do it. Oh, here we go. Do you guys see this? No. No, you don't see that. Okay, let me try share screen here. Is that it?
Ooh, yes, that's what's going down. Is that it, Samantha? Can you like? Yes, it is, Professor. Okay, good. Um, if you hit the present button at the very top, it will go into uh, like the present mode. At the very top, let's see. It'll be right next to the big yellow share button. Oh. Oh. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I took a pretty big deep dive into Christian humanism because specifically I love history and I find it very fascinating how humanism kind of stemmed into the creation of our nation. And so I started with um, the history of humanism and specifically kind of the idea behind Christian humanism at the very beginning. And it started out in the middle ages around that time, specifically with the idea that uh, Christian humanism respects the minds of humans and values the minds of humans specifically because God made us that certain way. And then um, I looked up into a lot about uh, Erasmus and versus Luther and their differences between their ideas and specifically with humanism. And I thought it was very fascinating with um, the difference between Luther, who thought it was more of willpower, there was no need for salvation through good, um, like good deeds, versus Erasmus did think that there was a need for good deeds for salvation, and that came from his learnings through the classics. Um, and with those two kind of powerhouses in Christianity, we also saw Martin Luther wanting to reform the Catholic Church the same way Erasmus did but specifically the movement away from the Catholic church. And that's a lot of what Christian humanism focused on through the Renaissance era was the kind of backlash towards the Catholic church. And that stemmed from a lot of deeds that the Catholic church took part of um, the idea that they could, you could pay to have your soul in heaven and a lot of those kind of misguided ideas, I guess you could say. And so that kind of jumped off Christian humanism into the Enlightenment era, which where we see Locke, uh, great thinkers like John Locke, who would describe himself as a Christian humanist, in that the same idea that you have the freedom of thought, freedom of expression, that we were made this certain way to be able to think and to be able to innovate, and then that um, pertained to our founding fathers, and Jefferson with writing uh, the Declaration of Independence, and specifically a lot of those ideas flow through that this nation was built upon the ideas that you can think for your own, you can discover and create and better society without the necessarily the big thumb of the king. And so that is that slide. Professor Beck, can you go to the okay. slide before this one? Oh boy, okay, let's now. see. Um, I don't, do I just, okay, this one? Do you have this one? Ah, yes, this okay. is the slide. Okay, so this is more of the roots of Christian humanism, specifically. Just a second, um, Sam. Somebody's got their mic on. Okay. So um, specifically with uh, the roots of Christian humanism, it started off with the idea of um, Jesus teaching the Good Samaritan and kind of that idea that you should be a good Samaritan no matter what is around you or who you come across and the idea of being a good human without the negativity using your own thought and reason and then it goes on to um, St. Paul specifically his teachings in the Catholic Church about uh, freedom against the constraint of a religious law and him kind of going against the grain of other Catholic priests at the time um, believing that you need to be able to study and think for yourself and then that there were certain constraints on religious law that would cause the issues within the Catholic Church and Saint no, Paul. No, that was the rabbi. Sorry, that was the oops, Jewish sorry. rabbi. No, no, you're That's good. Okay. <laughs> um, and then, basically, the next point would be Christian humanism took off in the Middle Ages and continued into the Renaissance. And right. then that is the end of. I believe there might be a third slide, but I don't know if I could put that in. Work oh side. yeah, and this is the work cited that I had specifically about that. But yeah. And I think Christian humanism is very fascinating, especially it's changed through time and how it took off kind of as a thought and idea and more of a different kind of leeway away from the Catholic teachings to kind of breeding and the growth of Protestant Protestantism. So, Actually, yeah. it was a kind of Christianity that was consistent with Newtonian physics, right? Yes. They were modern thinkers. 
So for Newtonian physics, it was the clockmaker who wound up the machine, right? Mm -hmm. So they would call themselves deists or theists. Yes, deism, yeah. Right, so then they would, uh, Unitarianism was big among them because they didn't accept Jesus was the Messiah, the Trinity, because that's absurd, right? And irrational. Mm -hmm. um, so Samantha, if you next fall, you want to do an advanced seminar where you just read these guys, right? Yeah. Like read what Locke, I mean, if you really care about this stuff, it really does matter. And you mm -hmm. can take an advanced seminar yeah. and just get credit for doing yeah that. so just keep that in mind because i always okay. take that seminar in the fall and if anybody else wants to write a paper on whatever they like um next fall i'm game for anything um who's next uh untari would you like to go sure professor um let me share my screen one second Ah, oh, very good. Yes, can you see my screen, Professor? Yes, yep. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, hello everyone. Um, so, humanism and Islam. I am a Muslim and I have faith in humanity. And even though I know that humanism is still often associated with killer or irreligion, Yet, if I have to present one type of humanism, it will be Islamic humanism. However, what I mean by Islamic humanism is not similar uh, to the definition of religious humanism, where they put humanism on top of religion, but rather what I mean is where the value of humanism and religion are aligned with each other. Um, oh, next. Um, wait. Oh, okay. Now, what is my motive to choose humanism and Islam? Um, first, I believe that humanism and religions should not be separated, but rather should be coexist. And by being coexisted, it doesn't mean they should accept everything or they should um, agree to everything, but complementing each other, like science religion situation. And the second one is because I also believe that both value of humanism and religion should support each other to create a better life. And then why Islamic humanism? First, the value of humanism is compatible with Islamic worldview. The core value emphasized by humanism, such as the dignity of each human being, individual liberty, freedom of choice consistent with the collective good, participatory democracy, human rights, social justice, and irrational and rational inquiry are all compatible with Islamic worldview. And the second one is Islam promotes humanism. Uh, Muslim view human as rational beings that are capable of obtaining happiness through knowledge, reason, and education. Moreover, Muslim, uh, Muslim humanists also hope to promote cooperation among humankind among humankind as the best way to achieve collective happiness. And the last one is Islam is a great proponent of humanism. Uh, for me, I mean, in my opinion, to, uh, because to make the world a better place, Islam primarily desire that humanity achieve justice and life in, and live in dignity and equality with one another. So I think most of value and um proposing humanism are compatible with islam that's why i like uh islamic humanism yes that's it professor thank you and the reference that i use is mostly from american humanists thank you okay okay let's see can you stop the screen share okay all right a round of applause for untari um I did want to say, Untari, that this sounds exactly like when I talk to all my colleagues in Indonesia. Um, but a lot of them actually didn't know 
they didn't think to unite Ponchasilla with Aristotle and humanism. And, but as a matter of fact, there are more humanist Muslims in Indonesia than anywhere else in the world, I think by far, because the vast majority of Muslims in Indonesia are humanist Muslims, right? They're multi-faith, they're open to other faiths. Um, so again, Untari, if you would like to do some kind of directed study just to have time to pursue this, it would, your country needs uh, people who are educated on this tradition because uh, Indonesia is always being threatened by extremists and they're always chipping away, right, Untari? Yes, yes, Professor. Yeah, so if you would like to do that, uh, we can talk to you know people at AUW or something. Um, it would be nice to do it. This will be next fall, but with uh, with the Lion students, because I think all of you would have interesting things to say to each other. But anyway, the way you frame it is there's maybe four students in the class. Each of them reads the books they want. This is a good humanistic education, right? <laughs> and they create the paper they want, but they have to report in every week and listen to each other and read a few pages of each other's, what each other's reading and stuff. So everybody really learns about everybody else's stuff. So if you wanna think about that, I would love to have you myself, but I also think in Indonesia would love to have you. <laughs> um, does that make sense, Untari? Uh, yes, that's yeah, sense, it, it really is important for Indonesia and Indonesians to get educated in that way of looking at things. Um, let's see, who, ah, Destiny. Greetings. Hello. Hold on, I will uh, figure this out. They are going to present today, Destiny. How's that? That was good. Good job. I'm working on it. It's my destiny to get this right. <laughs> All right. Uh, as probably everyone expected, I am now going to talk about humanism and capitalism. So the humanist perspective of um, economics has changed over time. In the 1933 manifesto, oh, hold on. I've got this weird little thing that's blocking my view of my own slides. <laughs> All right, here we go. In the 1933 manifesto, uh, it was pretty radical. It said that the existing system had shown itself to be inadequate and that a socialized and cooperative economic order must be established. So they were pretty openly calling for um, socialism, which is really a transition state between um, capitalism and communism. They wanted a um, directly uh, beneficial economic system to the people. They wanted it to be accountable to the people. Um, but in the 1977 manifesto, uh, there was a change in wording after the Cold War. As socialism became um, really unpopular in the public consciousness, uh, they changed the manifesto. And instead, they wanted an open and democratic society, a decentralized economy, but still very much one that was um, accountable to the people, open to change. They specifically said open to new economic systems and minimize poverty and hardship. So it was a little less um, specific, a little less controversial, but the core idea was the same. But by 1980, um, in writings by Paul Kurtz, the, um, who was one of what would become the counselor, Council of Secular Humanism, uh, in his writings, he puts property over all rights. He says that um, the right to private property uh, is the chief most 
humanist right, without which all others are useless. Somehow, somewhere, humanism began to put um, the right to own property without explaining why over all the other human rights. Wow. It was a swing to the right where a free capitalist market began to equate to human flourishing. I think that was probably a backlash to um, politics overseas, um, to the Cold War and the Red Scare. Right. Um, but that led to the idea of humanistic capitalism. Now I'm doing something called circumlocution where I talk around my perspective of a point so that you can pinpoint it in the end, which is why I'm talking about humanistic capitalism. It's the idea that capitalism, when checked by philanthropy by those with great wealth, is a force for the greater good. Capitalism in this argument stimulates the potential of humanity to succeed and to innovate through its inherent competitive environment. And those who do well in this system are supposed to give away the excess, helping those at the bottom while also enriching themselves. Because, you know, when a billionaire is a philanthropist, he gains publicity, he gains um, a consumer base. Um, and of course, the people that uh, benefit from it um, do have those, uh, that limited economic relief. But the fundamental problem of this ideology is that it requires the capitalist system, which inherently concentrates wealth upwards to forego profit its own driving force for innovation. In the capitalist system, um, the worker sells their, um, the product and the value of their labor, getting a fraction of the value of their labor in return so that the capitalist, the one who fronts the money, the resources for the worker to do work on, makes a profit, meaning that they gain the excess value that the worker sells. This inherently drives wealth upward. And profit is supposed to be the force that drives um, new technology, um, harder work, everything that capitalism stands for, productivity in general. But for capitalism to be checked by philanthropy, philanthropists must forego some or all of their own profit. It goes against uh, its own system. And the crux of it is we don't need philo philanthropy if there is no property to cure. <laughs> we don't need um, the wealthy to give up their wealth if there is no disparity to begin with caused by the upwards drive of wealth. So then we come to Marxist humanism. It's the counterpoint to humanistic capitalism where some humanists dismiss Marx as deterministic and therefore against human potential, the, this argument is that Marx was in essence a humanist thinker. He argued for human liberties and fulfillment, just that it wasn't being achieved under capitalism. Marxism is inherently a critique of capitalism's alienation of product from producer, among other things, and advocates for a system that centers labor's own determination of, it worth, of its worth. And that's a lot of words um, that are hard to process at once, but, what I'm saying here is uh, there is this core tenet of Marxism that um, the worker who creates value by performing work on something, say a carpenter, the capitalist is the one who provides the raw wood. He's the one who starts the business, who hires the worker, who gives the place to work. Now the worker is the one who actually carves the wood, who creates something that is worth that, that is worth um, more than what began. He puts effort and time, essentially selling pieces of his life, but he never gains the actual um, full value of his labor because if he did, 
the capitalist wouldn't gain anything. He would make back only what he put in, which is against the capitalist system. To a capitalist, the one who provides the resource is the one who gets uh, the most money back, even though they're not the one that transmutes the resource into the more valuable one. So inherently, the worker is alienated from the value of their product. And the capitalist becomes wealthier. Marxism opposes that. It believes that the worker who transmutes um, the resource into something more profitable, more sellable, uh, more in demand, um, the person who turns the wood into the chair uh, or the work of art or the rice into um, a five-star meal is the one who should determine uh, how much they get selling that food um, or selling that chair. Marxism believes that the worker should be able to um, create and then benefit from that creation directly. And a society centered on self-deterministic labor being, labor being made of people collectively is therefore inherently democratic, which is a humanist ideal. It wants to eliminate the middleman. It wants to um, create a society essentially in the simplest of terms where the worker um, does not forfeit a portion of their value to um, someone higher than them. And that is in essence humanistic. It um, advocates for the human themselves to be able to reach um, their fullest potential. And I like that because I am obviously, if you haven't figured it out by now, a Marxist. <laughs> In this sense of Marxism, right? Yeah, there, there is um, Marxism that Marx himself did not actually approve of. There are several kinds of Marxism, not all of them are the same. Right. It's just like being a Christian. You know? <laughs> you yeah. Know? An Episcopalian so, is not um, a Catholic. Right. I mean, as long as you define your terms. Um, OK, so Destiny, do you know about that um, store called Harps? No. Oh, OK. Well, I think it's a worker funded store and it's located right on the road on the way to um little rock there's a harps are you telling me harps is a co-op yeah i think i so. have never heard of that i'll have to look into it though i thought what it was it? a corporate chain oh i don't think so why don't you look it up because i think it's a co-op and that would be that's is that what you mean by socialism it just the people come together, um, put the money down, do their work collectively. All the decisions are made collectively. Is that? That's communism. Um, socialism, I think, is really capitalism with checks and welfare. Oh, OK. <laughs> That's what you call communism? is what, what I call communism. What did you just say? I said that socialism as a transition state between capitalism and communism is essentially capitalism with checks and welfare. Okay, okay. Yeah. Just like communism um, is supposed to be a transition state um, before a truly decentralized society forms. Um, there is the argument that communism eventually becomes a form of anarchy but I don't necessarily subscribe to that. I think that um, even if it is a small decentralized state, there will be um, a central government. 
keeping in mind that government uh, itself is made of people. Um, yeah, so like, I think an ideal communist government would be um, small, uh, but with um, official routes and representation. But that's a really con that's a really uh, controversial idea, even in like communist circles. So no one really knows um, what the ideal communist government would look like because no one has ever been able to put it into practice without it getting uh, absolutely nerfed by capitalists. <laughs> okay, so again, Destiny, if you are interested at all in getting three credits for just reading more about the rise of Marxism, you know, Stalin, Trotsky, and then also, you know, what's going on now, um, Marxist socialist movements. You know, anyway, just if you'd like to write a paper on that, next fall you could just sign up and everybody else I'm sure would be interested in hearing what you find out. Tell me more about this class. It's just called Advanced Seminar. And it, you just pick your subject and read your books and write your paper. Um, I love that, might do it. Okay, I mean, I think it would be fascinating if uh, each of you, you know what you've presented and the whole semester, each of you every week presents their latest discoveries and you really, everybody learns a lot. Um, question. I have a question. Yeah. Um, where do we turn in this presentation? Like you said, we had to write an essay and then make a presentation. So where do we turn in? You don't have to, you don't have to turn in the presentation. <laughs> really? There's not even the essay that we wrote to go with it? Oh, the essay. Yes. Yeah. The essay. Okay. Where does that go? Oh, just, uh, did I not put a post there? I'll make another assignment for that then. If I, if there is, I just didn't see it. Okay. I, okay. Now, who was it that asked somebody? Oh yeah. Kasturi, go ahead. Okay, professor. I'm just working on uh, picking out my presentation. And Poonam, let me just ask Poonam. Poonam, do you plan on presenting today? Did you have something to present? Well, I don't know. Anyway, go ahead, Kasturi. There we go. All right. Uh, professor, do I need to turn on my camera? I'm actually not well, and I'm not willing to show my face. I'm so oh. sorry. Well, <laughs> um, we can see your presentation here. We don't need, oh, yeah, you don't have to turn your camera on. You've got your presentation here. That's fine. Okay, so uh, as a psychology student from high school, I was... Uh, I was really fascinated about uh, biological psychology. Um, so under biological psychology, I also studied uh, how uh, evolution has shaped the mentality of human beings as well. So I was keenly interested in exploring more about uh, evolutionary psychology. And uh, during the course of learning humanism, uh, and uh, researching about the types of humanism that existed, I came across evolutionary humanism. So uh, I'm going to talk about uh, evolutionary humanism now. Uh, I'm not really sure why I cannot move. Professor, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you. Um, I think I need to. Um, Anybody got advice? There. 
Uh, yeah, now I can. So, <clears throat> uh, under evolutionary humanism, we uh, actually uh, talk about uh, uh, the concept of humanism and evolutionary. Um, uh, for uh, evolutionary humanism, the founder is considered uh, Julian Hogsley. I'm sorry if the pronunciation okay. uh, is different because uh, the way we pronounce in Nepal differs from what other people in other countries uh, pronounce. Uh, so this is the image of Julian Hogsley. Uh, Julian Hogsley was a, an English biologist and author who was born in London. Uh, he uh, propounded the modern synthetic theory of evolution under uh, natural theory of, uh, that was discovered by Darwin, Darwin. And he has also served as the first director of UNESCO. So now I'm going to talk about the principles of evolutionary humanism. So what do... Uh, evolutionary humanists think about uh, humanism. Uh, the first point that uh, evolutionary humanists think is that uh, man is a product of evolution, which basically means that uh, human beings have been, uh, human beings have reached at this point because of evolution. Uh, nothing can be generated in a second. Uh, it takes, uh, it takes time uh, for us to generate everything, right? So uh, in the similar manner, uh, human beings also have reached at this point because of evolution. Uh, the second thing that evolutionary humanists uh, believe in is that we should actively direct the evolution of our species and we should ensure that uh, we evolve into superhumans and not subhumans. Um, so uh, there are uh, stereotypes regarding evolutionary humanism, uh, where uh, where uh, evolutionary humanists they believe that Aryan race is the most advanced form of Homo sapiens. Uh, Nazism, it is the most uh, famous form of evolutionary humanism where Nazis, they believe that Aryan West is the most advanced form of Homo sapiens. Uh, I, am, I am sure that uh, most of you are aware of the fact that uh, the human race is classified into two races, Aryan race and Mongolian race. So Nazis, they believe that Aryan race is the most advanced form, but we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot see whether it is right or wrong because uh, it is not uh, known by the world. I mean, uh, only Nazis, they believe this fact, but then uh, we are not really sure whether uh, people from other countries or other parts of the world are aware of it or not, and they believe in it or not. So uh, uh, people also believe that uh, uh, if uh, uh, people of higher caste and they marry with the lower caste people, then uh, the superior caste or race will be polluted, which I don't think uh, uh, exists in reality. Um, and uh, when the pollution, I mean, when the superior race is polluted, then it will lead to devolution and uh, human beings, they will uh, turn into subhumans. So uh, uh, I would like to talk about uh, this context uh, relating with the context of Nepal. So in Nepal, uh, there are people who still believe that uh, if, uh, rich, uh, if uh, people of higher caste, they marry with the um, uh, people of lower caste, then their caste will be, uh, their level of caste will be uh, lower. I mean, it will go down 
because uh, for instance we have a uh, caste like uh, caste called brahmin and chetri uh, brahmin is considered to be the uh, most superior caste and after that we have chetris so if a boy of a uh, caste brahmin marries a girl of uh, caste chetri then uh, his entire caste i mean his uh, family's clan's caste will be converted into chetri which is a lower caste uh, in comparison to brahmin but then i'm not uh, really sure whether this uh, uh, idea um, it, uh, is can be implemented or not because we are all humans right so uh, since we are all human beings and our nature is same the way we think is quite similar then why is it that uh, if we marry uh, a people from a lower caste then then we will be uh, inferior in terms of our status or race uh, so many people believe that evolutionary humanism is a religion so uh, we are in a confusion whether it is a religion or not so i would like to clarify uh, whether it, uh, it is a religion or not uh, mm, people in the past they used to consider a, uh, evolutionary humanism as a religion uh, in the west they used to believe that uh, uh, these uh, human beings are responsible for keeping their state their country pure and white and that could be done only by limiting immigration of people from other parts of the countries uh, basically westerners they uh, used to um, restricts the uh, migration of people from a uh, country such as china and italy uh, they thought that it would help them keep their country pure um, and a sacred place so for me uh, evolutionary humanism is not a religion uh, so i think that uh, in um, Order to, in order for something to be a religion, uh, we have to uh, have the implementation of idea of superhuman order, where uh, things are uh, not in control of human beings. I mean, uh, things that we see or uh, hear are not the uh, outcome of human actions. But then uh, whatever we see or whatever we hear or whatever we uh, feel in this entire world uh, are actually the outcome of human beings, right? So uh, evolutionary humanism cannot be a religion. Also, in order to establish something as a religion, we have to have norms and values that each and every individual follows within a community or a society. But then uh, people in the past, they were not really educated and they were not aware of what norms and values means. So Mm, Westerners, uh, they did not have particular norms and values that existed in their society. Uh, so we cannot say that uh, evolutionary humanism was a religion and can no never be a religion at all. Uh, and yeah, since they had no norms and values, uh, people from other parts of the uh, other parts of the world, they were not aware of. Uh, what they believed in and what they thought was true, uh, which basically means it was not universal. Um, in uh, so uh, let us take an example of Christianity. So uh, uh, Christianity is such a religion which is uh, uh, popular in most of the parts of the world, and uh, uh, every Christian follower is. Um, mm, well aware of uh, the principles, rules, norms, and values of Christianity. Uh, he or she is able to speak up and uh, make other people aware of the uh, religion itself. But then uh, Westerners in the past, they were uh, not aware of the aim of their religion at all. I mean, they were not aware of uh, uh, what they were supposed to do and uh, uh, they could not uh, spread the uh, aim of their uh, culture worldwide. Uh, 
so because of this, we cannot uh, consider evolutionary humanism as a religion. Uh, so these are the sources that I went through in order to uh, prepare this presentation. Uh, so I'm done actually. Uh, if you have any queries, please go ahead. Well, did you get, uh, when you took biological psychology, you. you didn't get that kind of racism, did you? Uh, sorry, professor. It seems like we've proven that all that racism was a lie and false and it had no biological base or no scientific base. Um, it's been discredited as far as I know. Um, so I'm, I can't figure out how you got from biological psychology to this and the racism. You don't, do you agree with that racism? Uh, uh, actually, Professor, uh, so I actually studied uh, just a bit about uh, biological psychology, I mean the introductory part, and uh, so I studied how evolution and uh, biology, I mean uh, how evolution and environment impacts the uh, behavior of human beings. Uh, for instance, uh, when we look at how people at present uh, behave in front of other people, then we can actually go back uh, to the evolutionary evolution part where uh, our ancestors performed certain actions, right? Then we can uh, actually relate those actions with uh, the actions done by people at present. Mm, but then uh, the racism thing, uh, I only uh, got to know about uh, it uh, when I researched about evolutionary uh, humanism. Yeah. Okay, well, I could show you something about colonialism, right? Um, Western colonialism, it was based on this kind of racism. I can't find it, but I have a quote one of my students gave me and I will, I'll read it next time, but it was a British guy. Oh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. But anyway, McAloy, he went to India and he said, these people, they have this very amazing culture. Like nobody robs or steals. There's no violence. Everybody gets along. It's actually totally amazing. So we're going to have to absolutely destroy it if we want to conquer these people, <laughs> we have to tell them they're inferior. We have to tell them that Christianity is, you know, and it, it's just so cynical. And, but I mean, that's one, you know, they, the colonialism, they did tell non-white people that we are superior. But when you look at the motive behind it, it was clearly for empire building. It was all about power. It wasn't at all about, you know, cultural, um, anything biological or cultural. He was, he was amazed at what an incredibly harmonious culture there was in India. So I don't know. I mean, I just want to throw that out there as a, um, you know, if biology, bi I don't know, I, biological psych, if, if it's just parts of the brain and what they do, and then it's interacting with other people affects your brain or whatever it is. I don't know. It's a lot of different things, but um, I did want to point out that, yeah, that kind of racism was a major uh, blood bludgeon in colonialism. And I'm not in favor of that. But anyway, so if any of you, a lot of you sounded like, you know, Thomas liked ethical humanism, Alexis and Aiden. If you did like these traditions, next fall, you can, you know, if you have space in your agendas, you get a whole semester to just study it, read about it, read about related things, and just do that good old kind of humanistic education thing where you're motivated to actually think about something. Um, that you might take seriously in your adult life as a set of values and virtues or whatever. Um, so 
I think we have to um, we have to go. We're done. It's ten forty, and if anybody has questions or you know wants me to stay, I can do that. I'll stay. And otherwise, I'm going to post next week's stuff. Next week, we start with Confucian humanism. So we end up with Confucius, Hindu, Buddha, and um, Islam. So that's what we're, that's the plan. Have a good, whatever, how many days. You have a paper due. Um, have a good night, Professor. Bye-bye, Untari. Have a good day, Professor. Yeah, okay, Untari. <laughs> <laughs>